You may have noticed how quiet it is this morning in worship service. Well, Gwen is not here. Uh, she has been a little sickly the past few days, and so has Maya. And uh, so we uh, appreciate the prayers in behalf of, of, of them and, the, and their sickness. And uh, the rest of the family is doing fine so far. And so hopefully that will uh, be uh, taken care of uh, pretty soon. It's good to have our visitors. Good to have everyone with us this morning. Hopefully you, hopefully you will stay for our Bible classes after our worship service and come again at 6 o'clock tonight for evening worship service. About 3,000 years ago, there was a king by the name of David. He ruled over the nation of Israel as the second king of that nation, appointed by God. The nation of Israel was planted by God. The kings were given to them at the request of the people. The first king was Saul, who was a good king at first, then unfortunately he went bad. David was chosen to replace King Saul to be king over Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we looked at this last week, God spoke through Nathan to David the prophet and gave him a promise. A promise that was going to be made with him and his family that will go into the New Testament period as we will see a little bit later on. The reason why God spoke to Nathan is because David, as we saw last week, wanted to do something for the Lord. He wanted to build a temple for the Lord. He said in his heart, it's not fair that I dwell in a a house of cedar and the uh, ark of the Lord dwell in a tent. So he wanted to build a temple. Nathan said, go do what's in your heart. However, that was not God's will. We learned some lessons from that last week. One of which is just because someone wants to do something religiously in their heart that does not mean that's God's will. And therefore God spoke through Nathan to David and says, here's what's going to happen and here is the promises that I will make to you and to your family. Notice there in verse 8, 2 Samuel 7, verse 8 through 16. Now therefore, thus uh, shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. Here's the will of God to David. I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. God chose David to be the king over Israel. Verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone, have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. God blessed David and exalted David. David did not seek to be exalted, but God blessed him because he was a humble servant of God. Verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them, and they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. Verse 11, Since the time I commanded the judges to be over my people Israel, that would be the book of Judges, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, also the Lord tells you that He will make you a house. Now, the word house here is being used in two different senses as we see it in the context here. Remember, David wanted to make God a house, a temple. But God said, I didn't ask for that. I didn't ask for you to build a house. You're not authorized to do that. He says, but I tell you, verse 11, that I will make you a house. The word house here is being used to refer to a family, a household, a ruling dynasty. I am going to make you a ruling dynasty. And therefore, from David on forward, all the kings of Judah would be a descendant of King David, starting with Solomon and going forward. Now, not all of them were good. Not all of them were the people they should have been. 
And the ones that were wicked will be punished and the ones that were righteous will be rewarded. But they were all going to be a descendant of David. David would be their ancestor. I will make you a house, a ruling dynasty, a ruling family. Verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers. It's talking about when he dies. I will set up your seed after you, your descendants, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom, the certainty of a future kingdom with the descendants of King David. Verse 13, he shall build a house or a temple for my name. Now here's the second sense in which the word house is being used. In verse 11, the word house is being used to refer to a family, a ruling family, a dynasty. In verse 13, it's referring to a house in the sense of a temple, a physical structure. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He is going to have authority to rule. Verse 14, I will be his father, he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, who I remove from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established before, forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now there are many great lessons and promises that we're going to look at both this morning and tonight. I want to look at a few of them this morning. And then tonight we'll look at the rest of these promises that are made to King David. I want you to notice this, verse 15. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from uh, Saul, whom I removed from before you. If he commits sin, in verse 14, uh, commits iniquity, he will be chastened with the rods of men. However, I'm not going to remove my mercy from him like I did Saul. 2 Samuel 7 and verse 15 is a very important verse when you're talking about whether or not a person can lose their salvation. King Saul, the very first king of Israel, lost the mercy of God because he turned his back on God. He became wicked. And God removed His mercy from him. And God is saying, I'm not going to remove the mercy of of the person who is going to be your descendant. And notice, it is because He's going to build a house for my name, verse 13. And I'm going to have a father-son relationship with Him. There's going to be that relationship there. And because of that, the mercy will not depart from this individual as the mercy was taken from King Saul. You see, if we depart from God's way as King Saul did, if we go to the dark side as Saul did and chose to do, we will have God's mercy removed from us. We have to live in harmony with His will. 1 John chapter 1 in the New Testament tells us we must walk in the light as He is in the light. When we do that, the blood of Christ cleanses the Christian. When they're confessing their sins, God is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Within the context there, 1 John chapter 1, the point is we have to keep His commandments. We have to do His will. Saul did it first, but then he departed from that and the mercy of God was taken from him. Now let's look at this as we consider... What's going on here? As as I said earlier, the word house in verse 11 is used differently than the word house in verse 13. The The word house there in verse 11 of 2 Samuel 7 is used to describe a ruling dynasty. Keep your place here and turn to Matthew chapter 1. We look throughout biblical history and we see God fulfilled this promise. David lived approximately about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And during that period of time, there were kings that came from the uh, body of David as his descendants. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6. 
You have the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, being listed here. And by the way, Matthew was writing to Jews. That's why he starts with Abraham in this genealogy. You look at verse 6. Jesse begat David the king. Begot David the king. David then begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon would be the next king. Solomon would be the one who would immediately fulfill the promises and the prophecies being made here in 2 Samuel 7. We'll see that in just a moment. And then we go further. Solomon begat Rehoboam, verse 7. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram, Joram begot Uzziah, Uzziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, Ahaz begot Hezekiah, Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah, one of the great kings of Judah, King Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. There's where the book of Daniel comes into play. That was the time of Ezekiel and Daniel when they were taken away into captivity under the reign of Jeconiah. Then you have uh, verse 12. After that, you were brought to Babylon. Uh, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begat Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was one of the ones that was involved in the people coming back after the 70-year captivity. Then you have the lineage going all the way down to verse 16, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom is born Jesus, who is called Christ. There's that royal dynasty traced all the way from David, all the way through during the time of the southern kingdom, all the way even through the time of the 70-year captivity, and when the people returned to the land, all that period of time, there was that seed line being traced, and it comes all the way up to Joseph, who was the legal earthly father of Jesus, according to the flesh. Interesting thing about the genealogy found in Luke's account, Luke traces the genealogy of Jesus through his mother Mary, and they both have a common ancestor in King David. Both Mary and Joseph have an ancestor in King David. And they were distantly, distantly related to one another. So we see here this promise was fulfilled. We look at these passages here in 2 Samuel 7 and we say, what does this have to do with me? Well, Jesus was a descendant of King David and God was bringing about and unfolding his scheme of redemption to bring Jesus into the world to save me. To save you. So the church, the kingdom, could be established. And therefore we see the importance of these genealogies. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. That royal lineage is mentioned here. In Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Holy Spirit through Paul says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We were looking at one of these prophets, Nathan, what he said. Verse 3, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He is a descendant of King David according to the flesh. But he is the Son of God with power and he proved that by his resurrection from the dead. Oftentimes within the gospel accounts, someone would call out to Jesus and say, Son of David, have mercy on me. That was a messianic title. They recognized Jesus of Nazareth being of the household of David. Now... Let's look at house in a uh, different sense. In our text, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 13, talking about the one who would build a house 
for my name, God says, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. This is talking about a physical structure, the temple. We know that Solomon immediately fulfilled this after David. David prepared the material. He got everything ready for the building of the temple. But it was going to fall to his son, Solomon, to build that temple. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 6, God said, 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 6, Solomon would build the temple. So Solomon was authorized to build a house for the Lord. David wasn't, but Solomon was authorized. So David got all the material ready, got everything prepared, built up a great deal of wealth for Israel. And therefore, when the time had come, those stones that were already cut could be put into place. Everything was ready. David prepared the way for Solomon to build that temple. And you read about the construction and the furnishing of that temple in 2 Chronicles chapters 3 through 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 through 6. It was a beautiful temple. It was something to behold. It was very expensive. It cost millions and millions of dollars in our a way of measuring currency today. It was an elaborate temple. But it foreshadowed something even greater. It foreshadowed something even greater. Stephen says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 48 that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. That temple of the Old Testament foreshadowed something greater. It foreshadowed a greater house, the church. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He was giving a prediction, a prophecy about the establishment of His temple, the church, composed of people who are saved, those who are His people. Look at 2 Corinthians Chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, and verse 16. Paul asks a series of questions here. He says, What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. As he's writing to the Lord's church, he's writing to Christians, he's saying you have no agreement with false religion. You should not be having fellowship in a spiritual sense with false religion because you are the temple of the living God. So that temple that was built by Solomon foreshadowed the greater temple, which is the church of Christ. And so we see here, he says, God said, I will dwell in them. I'll walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And when we live according to God's will, as revealed in the word of God, God dwells in us. We know this. Oh, we don't feel this. We know this based upon the promises of God. And therefore, we have that promise fulfilled ultimately in Jesus Christ and the establishment of His church. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. As Paul talks about how wonderful the church is in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There's household there. You're members of the family of God. Verse 20, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, notice verse 21, in whom the whole building, the whole building being fit together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. He's talking about the church. Verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. One greater than Solomon built a greater temple. And he built that temple, it's the church. 
And when a person becomes a member of it, they become a living stone in that structure. Look at Second, um, First Peter, First Peter chapter two, First Peter chapter two, verse four and five. As Peter identifies the people of God and reminds them of who they are in this world. First Peter chapter two, verse four and five. Peter says, coming to Him, talking about Jesus, as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, he's talking to Christians, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So the church of Christ is the temple of God today and therefore the promise to build that house was ultimately fulfilled in jesus christ he purchased the church with his own blood acts 20 and verse 28 he is the head over that church and he being the savior is the one who places those who obey him into that temple as living stones So what we've seen this morning is, according to the promises made to David, about a thousand years before they were fulfilled, he promised David that you will have a ruling dynasty. You will have a house. I will establish your house, your family, your ruling dynasty. And God fulfilled that promise and brings us all the way up to Jesus Christ, our Savior. He also said, you're this son of mine, which will come from your body, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Well, that's the perfect relationship we see in Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. God is his father. Also, Jesus would be the one to build that greater temple, that greater house. Oh, Solomon did build the house under God's instruction. But it was meant to foreshadow the greater house, the temple not made with hands, which is the Lord's church today. Oh, there's other things we're going to talk about tonight, Lord willing, when we talk more about the kingdom and the throne that Jesus is ruling and reigning on now. The question this morning is this, are you in the kingdom? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you been added to the church? Believe in Jesus. Confess Him as the Son of God. Repent of all your sins and we have water available. We can baptize you, immerse you into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll be added to the church. Not a denomination, but the temple of God. If you've done that and you've gone astray, you're not holy as you ought to be. The the temple is to be holy, to be separate and distinct from the world. If you've not been, we urge you to repent. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and while we sing.